Yes, what we're going to talk about is uh, fasting. Uh, the term fasting means to abstain from food, solid food. And contemporarily, when we're talking about fasting, we're talking about liquid food as well, that is juices, fruit juices and vegetable juices. Now fasting, um, the term meant to abstain, and we usually consider a fast when you go to sleep at night and you wake up in the morning, uh, you have a period of time where you break your fast, and they call that break fast. And that's because of the history of fasting, that's where the term breakfast comes from, or breakfast as we say, but it means break your fast. And another thing is uh, a person should have their stomach empty before they go to sleep, and that's why they say, are you fast asleep? Meaning, abstain from food, fast asleep. So the words, if you trace them back in their origin, you'll find that always refer to a period of time when people fasted. Now, for African people, fasting occurred during certain scheduled times of the year, uh, during harvesting season, just before harvest, there would be a fast. See, when you have plenty of food around and just before the food supply dwindles down, the amount of food you eat decreases and that puts you on a fast. And then you have the harvest when there's plenty of food again. So between the harvesting season, there was a time when you fasted. These were scheduled by nature. Then there are fasts that are scheduled by the sun and we use the solstice for that, the winter solstice, the summer solstice. That's when the sun is the highest point from the equator. So they help you schedule a fast, and they are fasts uh, based on religions, the 40 days and 40 nights without food, which is called uh, quarantine in the Italian. That's where the word quarantine comes from, fasting. So we have fastings that are scheduled by religions, fasting that's scheduled by the sun, and fasting uh, that are scheduled by harvesting seasons. Nature, of course, um, causes uh, you to fast. Um, all animals, whenever they are sick, they stop eating and they'll go get a herb, a dog will do it, a cat, as well as horse and cattle. They will go on a fast, they will just stop eating. And that puts them on a fast because a fast has a curative uh, element to it. That's why we fast it. It helps to regenerate the system and nourish the system. So it's a time when you give back to nature. During the uh, time that you're eating, you're taking from nature. And during the fast, you're supposedly giving back to nature and that gives you a balance. And that's what fast was meant to do, to put you back in equilibrium with nature, a time when there's fasting, a time when there's not fasting. So um, the uh, fast, as it's known today, uh, includes uh, liquid food, as I mentioned before. And when you're using liquid food, such as uh, apple juice, raw apple juice, uh, orange juice, grapefruit juice, and vegetable juices, spinach, beet, carrot, um, that's when you concentrate the juice from the plant. So whenever you're dealing with a concentrate, you have to take a lot of more fluids. So you drink more water when you're drinking liquid, such as the juices and the vegetable juices and fruit juices. So your water con the content should be escalated because of the concentrated nature of the juices. So that helps uh, flush out your system. Uh, let's just start from someone who's never been on a fast before. The biggest fear usually is I'm going to starve to death. Some pe reason people just think they're going to starve and drop and die. But that doesn't happen. Um, usually uh, this business about starving, that's a starvation diet. We're not talking about starvation. We're talking about a controlled period of time when you're on water or juices or liquids. That's fasting as opposed to starvation. But most of the time when you say fasting, people are thinking of starving to death. But we're not talking about that. Not at all. We're talking about uh, controlled period of time where you're abstaining from eating solid food to rest your digestive system. Now, um, the fear about starving to death, that doesn't happen. Um, the fear of uh, being so hungry that you'll just run and get something to eat. Usually when the uh, small intestines and large intestines are emptied of all the food, uh, that's when you lose the craving for food. There are things that you can take for craving such as um, glutamine, a glutamic acid, which is amino acid, which reduces the craving. There's a herb called quassia, which reduces craving. And there's a mineral uh, uh, supplement, as we call it, called chromium, which also reduces craving. Uh, quassia is named, the herb quassia is named after an African man 
who was using that herb during that particular time and the um, Europeans wanted it so they chased him down to South America where this herb was found and found out where the herb was and how to locate it and after they found this information they killed the African man by the name of Kwasia. So it's a kind of a mixture of uh, our history involved in this herb and involved in chromium and invo involved in glutamic acid as well. So these uh, substances, the supplement of chromium, the herb, uh, quassia, and the amino acid, glutamic acid, or glutamine help reduce the craving. So you can take that while you're on the first three days of your fast to help reduce the craving and the kind of impulse that you're going to starve and die to die of death or something of that sort. Um, let's just go back to, uh, like I said, someone who's never fasted before with these misconceptions about starving to death and uh, the misconception about uh, having a craving, they'll just run and get something to eat. And also the misconception that their body, when they're on a fast, is eating itself up. Um, that comes out of uh, European mythology and superstitions. Uh, in their uh, system of thoughts, uh, as some people like to call it, uh, the Europeans believe that they are being attacked by someone or, or they're going to attack someone. So they're constantly in this dichotomy of either they're going to attack something or something's going to attack them. Uh, either they're going to be attacked by a germ that gives them a cold, or either they're going to attack the germ that's going to give them the cold with some kind of medicine or something of that sort. So they always believe in this attack and taking either I take something from you or you take something from me. That's based in their superstition. So they believe either you're eating or something is eating you. That's why they say, what's eating you? That sort of terminology comes out of European superstition and mythology. So they believe that when you go on a fast that your body is resorting to cannibalism and eating itself. That is just plain stupid, actually. I don't want to be scientific about it anymore. That's just stupid. Uh, what happens is uh, you have a, a, for example, you have a ship that's at sea. And uh, so the ship is about to sink. And uh, you figure the only way to save this ship from sinking is to get rid of anything that's going to hold it down, put too much weight on it. So you start throwing out the uh, extra furniture you have on the ship, the, the stereo, the TV, uh, the video, God forbid, I'm sorry, keep your video, uh, throw out the chairs and the tables and all that sort of thing to stop this ship from sinking. That's what the body does. It gets rid of all access, all weak things that's going to stop it from preserving life. And that's what the Europeans call your body eating itself. That is not true. What happens is all the mucus and congestion, it gets in the way of the two cells rubbing together. See, one cell rubs to the right, the other rubs to the left, and these cells rubbing together creates energy, pure energy. And anything that stops these cells from getting together, the body gets away from, because the body needs this energy. So it throws out the mucus and gives you a cold, as you call it, and you may break out with bumps and things of that sort. It gets rid of it, throws out all these things, throws away all the toxins that are stored in the fat because that is stopping the body from making energy, stopping the two cells from rubbing together. So it gets rid of all of this excess weight. And that's why you find after the first week of a fast, according to studies done in Sweden, Sweden, excuse me, and other European countries who have kept people in a glass con container or isolated them in a room and watched them under scientific observation and only gave them water, they found that they gained weight in the second week of fasting because their body was creating pure energy. This is something that happens on a fast. I know it's kind of hard for you to uh, probably uh, understand, but the body is creating pure energy and therefore is able to gain pure weight instead of fat weight. And that happens during the fast. So around the third day is when your uh, small intestines, which you call your stomach, this is your small intestines, the stomach is up higher behind the rib cage. Uh, your small intestines empties itself, the colon empties itself, and you no longer have any food in your body. That occurs on the third day of the fast, and that's when you lose the craving. So there's no fear about starving and uh, your body eating itself because that does not occur in, in nature. That's really just a superstition. So um, we start our fast the same way you, you start in life. You see, the food is introduced to you gradually. You are not born, and in the first day of your birth, your mother gives you a full-course meal. 
that's not how it's done even in nature. So this fasting has to be introduced to you gradually. So what you do is you reduce the amount of combinations of food that you're taking into your body. Um, you're used to eating uh, maybe collard greens and uh, a starch or potato and some meat and maybe some tea and coffee and a glass of milk and spaghetti and cheese and whatever these other concoctions are that people seem to think of food. Uh, you're used to eating all these things, so you reduce the, the amount of food combinations that you have till you reduce it down to maybe two combinations of food. Say, for instance, you would just, uh, one day you would eat uh, apples and oranges and pears and tangerines and melons and strawberries, and you start just reducing it down till the day before you go on your fast, you're only eating one type of food. Say you're just eating oranges all that day, so you're reducing the food combinations down from three to two to one. You eat all oranges for one day. And then when you go on your fast, you're drinking one type of juice all day. And then you start drinking two combinations, pears and apple juice. And then you start making more combinations of juices, lemons and oranges and grapefruit. You're making more combinations. And that gives you a combination of nutrients, but this is how you slowly introduce these combinations to your system, just as it's slowly introduced to you as a child. So before we go on the fast, we reduce the combinations of food. We reduce the cooking time that you're used to having with food, where you're cooking food maybe for how some people cook a pot of beans for two days and collard greens for three weeks. We don't want to do that. We want to um, lightly steam the greens. So we're getting it to a raw state. And while you're doing this, always take a digestive enzyme because your body is probably not used to digesting raw foods. So you don't want to tax the system that much. So take a digestive enzyme all the time while you're taking raw juices so your body can get all the nutrients out of the juices. Uh, there is a fasting kind of craze where fast will save you from all these illnesses and this and that. But you can only get out of the fast what you put in it. It's important that you go on the fast correctly, and it's important that you maintain the fast correctly, and it's important that you come off the fast correctly. If you come off the fast with a whole lot of combinations of food, heavy starches, you have just ruined everything that you've done. You want to come off of it gradually, go into it gradually, just as nature introduces you to food gradually. So we, uh, for instance, the first day uh, of uh, getting into the fast, we'll just use three days. So. Uh, first day before, on this three-day period before we go into the fast, we're eating apples, oranges, bananas, papayas, mangoes, and we're eating quite a variety of uh, fruits. Because fruits cleanse the body, whereas vegetables tend to stabilize the body, so we want to cleanse the body. Uh, and so we're eating those combinations of fruits, and then we reduce it down to, say, two or three pears and apples and oranges, and then on the third day, that's the day before the fast, we eat only one type of fruit the fruit of our choice, uh, whatever fruit you choose. And then we go into the fast, uh, which can be a liquid juice fast, as I mentioned before, or a water fast. Now, we don't want to go into a week or two week or a month fast. We're not trying to do anything heroic here. But we'll probably go into a one day fast to start off and then gradually work our way to two days or three days or a week of just fasting on liquids, uh, knowing that we have to dilute these juices because they're too concentrated. So when you're making a raw orange juice, you want to drink uh, one half raw orange juice and one half water, mix them together. And then you want to drink uh, one third orange juice and two thirds water, mix them together. Until the third day of the fast, you're drinking just water. And then you go out of that fast the same way you came in. One third juice, two thirds water. One half juice, one half water. And then you're drinking just the plain juice by itself without the water. And then you're going back into eating one type of fruit, then two types, then the combination, and then you're out of the fast again. So you can approach the water fast that way and the juice fast that way. Knowing that there are certain healing elements involved in all the fruits and vegetables, they are usually based on the uh, color breakdown of the melanin. Um, the pineal gland makes the melanin and it has a color uh, breakdown which we call indigo, violet, blue, and orange, and red, and green. These are the colors made uh, from melanin. And we want to concentrate into our, our fruits the same way. 
We want to use a variety of colors, which gives a variety of nutrients, which stimulates the, the hormones in the fruits, because fruits possess hormones, and these same hormones go into your body and stimulate the hormones in your body. Hormones drive the energy, give it a direction, tell it which way to go. So we are driving the pineal gland, which stimulates the pituitary, which makes a melanin site kind of stimulating hormone, melanocyte stimulating hormones, which stimulates the melanin in the pineal gland. So we're getting into the whole triangle of the glandular system. We're stimulating each gland by the various colors. Usually, when you're dealing with the colors, the higher colors, such as the sun, which is yellow and orange and red, and you're coming down to the darker colors, you're coming closer to the earth. You're coming closer to the original source of the color, which is the pineal gland. So we want to use a variety of colors. We want to use purple fruit, such as grapes, and we want to use orange fruits, and we use green fruits, such as oranges, which are dyed orange by the Europeans. They're not really orange. So we want to use a variety of fruits, and the fruits that have a variety of colors, because usually they have at least one or two colors to the skin. They possess one or two or more colorings uh, that stimulate the body. Because the body is a, a rainbow-producing instrument. The more of the rainbow you put in the body, the more of the rainbow you get out of the body. That's why it's important while you're on the fast to stimulate your pineal gland by blinking at the sun before noon and afternoon to help stimulate that pineal gland. That should be done every day, as well as taking a bath every day because the toxins are being released through your skin and you want to get them out. So you take a bath to help flush those toxins out and get them off your skin. And the waste is accumulating because, as I mentioned before, you have this ship that's uh, sinking. So the body's throwing away all the excess baggage. And so all this excess waste is accumulating in the colon, small intestines, large intestines. So uh, an enema would be necessary. Enema can consist of a catnip herb tea, which relaxes. And you can use a stimulant kind of tea also in that, a little bit of lobelia. Or you may want to add one or two leaves of senna, which is a laxative, to help get the waste out of the system. It's, help, it's very helpful for the body to take some herbs like uh, Irish moss or some herb like slip around because they form a lot of mucus and help wash the system too. So we want to be mindful there are quite a variety of teas to be taken while you're on the fast to help cleanse your body because that's the purpose of the fast, to regenerate the body, spiritualize the body, and cleanse the body. The fast is holistic. If we just look at it as a physical mechanism, then that's all we're going to get out of it is physical. We're going to be earthbound. We're not going to stimulate our men mental being, our spiritual being, and our human being in its totality. So we want to use some herbs to help the healing and the cleansing progress along. We want to go and get some uh, portiaco. We want to use some chaparral, some golden seal, echinacea, red clover, burdock for the skin, chickweed for the skin. Such herbs as that to help cleanse the body, knowing that the, the process is we want to pull the mucus from deep inside out. So we want to cleanse the lymphatic system with echinacea. We want to cleanse the blood with red clover. We want to cleanse the uh, skin with burdock and chickweed. And looking at all the different healings we can do, juniper berries for the pancreas, yarrow for the pancreas, red raspberry for the pancreas as well. We want to cleanse every organ system, including liver. We may want to cleanse that with some milk thistle and various herbs that are beneficial for the liver, such as dandelion. So we're going from one herb to another herb, working on each organ system in the body to cleanse it, cleansing the, the lungs with mullein and with ginkgo and with a uh, little bilia, as I mentioned before. And uh, the, we need to work at not only the lungs, we have to work at cleansing the kidney, uh, we can use uva ursi, we can use buchu, we can use kuba berries, we can use palmetto berries. We want to cleanse each system, the blood, the kidney, the pancreas, the liver, the large intestines, small intestines with slippery arm, as I mentioned, iris marsh, those things that form a lot of mucus in the body. So we're using the teas, we're using the herbs, we're using the vegetables, as some people like to call them, the carrots, um, the beets, beet juice, carrot juice, um, we're using spinach juice, we're using um, the leaves of turnips, we're using turnip greens as well, and turnips and beet tops and carrot tops, we're using parsley. We're making a combination of vegetable juices to cleanse the system. So all of these are part of the cleansing action of the herb, along with the digestive enzyme to release some of that burden of breaking down the food off the liver. 
the liver has other responsibilities in the body other than concentrating on making bile. The liver senses the red blood cells and say this cell should go, this cell should stay, and whatever cell should stay, it turns it into bile, help break down toxins in the system. So we want to use those as well, some fenugreek perhaps because it has choline in it and it helps emulsify fat. Uh, lecithin does the same thing as well. And so uh, guar gum helps slow down the burning of substances. So if you're having a problem such as diabetes mellitus or, or pancreas disease, then you not only want to funk, uh, focus on the yarrow and the raspberry and the juniper berries, but you also want to help slow down the burning process of the uh, sugar. So you may want to use glucomanin, glucomanin, which is a herb that helps slow down the burning, and guar gum slows down the burning and releases some of the stress off the pancreas. So the cleansing, we're using herbs, we're using juice, as I mentioned before, red beets for the liver and you know, as well as for the blood. And of course, carrots have a lot of calcium in them and that's good for your system and vitamin C, such as you're finding yams. We want to use the yam as well if we're using the carrot juice because the yam has the vitamin A, the vitamin C, it's good for diabetes, it's good for digestion, and it's a sprout. And so therefore, it has a concentrated amount of energy in it. So we're using all these combinations of plants and herbs, flushing out our colon with an enema daily, with a catnip, as I mentioned before, uh, one or two leaves of senna, and some soothing kind of herb uh, along with it, some slippery elm, and some garlic. Catnip and garlic is also an excellent uh, enema to give yourself. And uh, the baths, as well as blinking the eyes, looking at the sun before noon and afternoon, and uh, walking barefoot to get that uh, high amount of concentrated charge out of the uh, body, and doing some spiritual exercises as well. Uh, and this is done with uh, herbs such as uh, go to cola, which helps bring a lot of blood to the brain. So we want to infuse the brain with blood with a go to cola and use herbs such as false unicorn uh, to help stimulate the glands or Damiana. So we're using go to cola, false unicorn or blessed thistle and Damiana in a combination to stimulate the pineal gland because this fast is not going to work without the stimulation, proper stimulation of the pineal gland because that's the first line of defense for black people. Aside from that, the pineal gland makes the nucleus, as they call it in science, of every cell in the body, so it's responsible for making the brains of every cell in the body. So we have to properly stimulate the pineal gland, which usually gets very sluggish and deficient in its produ production of melanin on a European diet because European diets are anti-melanin from their beginning and to their end because they're so mucus forming and backwards uh, in their establishment. So we want to uh, reconstitute and reestablish the balance of the pineal gland. And this may take some uh, lecithin uh, to help wash out the liver to free it so it can help because the liver gives the sugar supply to the brain that it needs to operate and it may take some lysin, maybe one or two days of lysin on, uh, in between your on a, when you're on your water, not when you're on your juice. Uh, 2,000 milligrams will probably do that. And that helps reestablish the balance of the pineal gland, pituitary, hypothalamus, the thymus, the thyroid, and adrenal glands. Remembering that whenever the body is in a crisis and the body perceives the fast as a crisis, it will fire off the adrenal glands, which sits on top of the kidney. And the adrenal glands makes something called adrenaline. And adrenaline is simply something that's used for uh, defense fight or flight kind of response. Just as the uh, parasympathetic system, uh, uh, part of the autonomic nervous system, is used for fight or flight to get you out of a crisis situation. So that uh, adrenaline will probably be excess in your body and only the liver can get rid of this excess adrenaline. That's why it's important to work on the liver with yarrow, dandel damiana, not damiana, dandelion, and milk thistle and other herbs that are good for cleansing the liver because the adrenal, adrenal glands are going to fire off and they sometimes become fatigued. And pantothenic acid helps relieve that fatigue on the adrenal glands. And you can get those from just the, uh, the hormones and the vegetables and fruits themselves, such as mangoes, papayas, uh, kiwi, star fruit. All of these help establish the balance. They are uh, tropical fruits and they're the fruits that our ancestors ate, such as Imhotep, Hatshepsut, uh, Ames, and uh, Ramesses and uh, Minis. Uh, Narman is called catfish, the man who united the two kingdoms, Upper and Lower Egypt, fighting the, uh, uh, 
those marauding bandits known as Europeans. All of our ancestors was raised on this diet and it was done on purpose. That's why we produce such a higher civilization and produce such uh, technologies and, and sciences as calculus and astronomy and architecture because our diet was holistic and natural and it included fasting periodically based, as I mentioned before, on the harvesting seasons or on the solstice and based on the inherent rhythm of the body because African people are on a solar rhythm whereas the Europeans are on a lunar rhythm. They are mostly moon concentrated people. That's why do you find so many uh, references to the moon in their culture. Um, they speak of romance about the moon. Uh, they, when they get married they go on a honeymoon. Um, they have uh, stars at night and the moon glows in your hair. Everything is about the moon. They are mostly moon-centered people and we are solar-centered people. So to go on that kind of a regimen of diet is anti the rhythm of our system. So we mostly go into a three-year kind of rhythm. That's what the pineal gland is on. Uh, our eating was based on the sun. The metric system is based on the sun. The calendar is based on the sun. Our religion, uh, the comedic religion, uses the symbology of the sun, Ra and Re. Uh, the child is carried in the solar center of the mother. The mother's umbilical cord is on the sun. Uh, birthing uh, of children occurred every three years in Africa. That's based on the sun. Everything was solar centered in our culture. And that's because of the high amount of importance and respect that our ancestors had for the pineal gland, which is stimulated by the hormones and fruits, which possess all the nutrients that the pineal gland needs. It helps stabilize the balance. So we want to re reaffirm that balance with the fruits on our fast and lean more toward tropical fruits as the Europeans call it, the mangoes, papayas, the kiwi, the star fruit, all those so-called tropical fruits, the pineapple, they are very responsive to the sun. They ferment and they ripen in the sun, they're very responsive and they're cooked by the sun naturally. Whereas the Europeans try to duplicate that fire energy and just started cooking foods and destroyed the whole nutrient content of the foods by cooking them and uh, depletes the foods of their vitamins, it makes the calcium and magnesium uh, too coarse to be digested. So in a raw form, the food is highly digested. And so this raw uh, energy, which we're getting from the fast, is what's going to rekindle our system. Um, the uh, other things, aside from the importance of the solarity of the uh, fast and of our system and this penile melanocyte uh, uh, foundation, um, is to do the proper spiritual exercise. Uh, I don't mean by spirit with perhaps um, some religious structure means by some club as they really are, these religious structures. I'm talking about spirit in the purest African sense of the word. To be spiritual is, means to know why you're on earth and your purpose in life. That's what spirit means in African uh, thought. So what we want to do is reaffirm why we're here and our purpose in life. And that is possessed in our genetic code. And our genetic code, again, is, is stored in our melanin, which is produced by our pineal glands. So what we want to do is, is generate all the energy we can electromagnetically by electromagnetically stimulating it with the pineal gland. That is the purpose of visualizing, for example, while you're on the fast, to spiritualize your uh, cerebral spinal fluid. That's the fluid that's in your backbone, as you call it. It goes from the ventricles, these empty spaces in your brain that are filled with fluid. This fluid is in it called cerebral spinal fluid and it goes down your back and up your spine again. It's milked by your muscles. So what you do is visualize the cerebral spinal fluid down where your genitals are. Rest your hands on your knees, sit slightly forward, tilt your head down like this and visualize a solar system. If you can't do that, just hold a unk in your hand by your navel and visualize the energy coming up from there, slowly coming up your spinal column, slowly coming up to the top of your head, and going back down your spine again, back down to your genital organs through your solar center. That spiritualizes or gives your cerebral spinal fluid electromagnetic charge because the pineal gland is rooted in the third ventricle, which we have that trinity again, the mother, the father, and God, the 
man and woman and God, the Trinity concept, which the Europeans call Father and Son and Holy Ghost eliminating the woman because they have a, a inferiority about uh, their women for some reason. I don't know why. But in any case, we uh, reaffirm this kind of trinity of man again and woman again. And that's uh, what the pineal gland does. When the cerebral spinal fluid comes back up to the ventricles, the pineal gland charges it for elect electromagnetically and then it's sent back down. And they call that the regenerative principle of generating yourself or generating your tree because your spine looks like a tree. And they call that the tree of life with its branches or they call dermatomes that go through your body all the way around, which the Chinese call meridians, which we call a tree. So we want to do that proper spiritual exercise while you're sitting or while you're standing. And while you're doing this exercise, deep breathing is very important. You breathe in very slow, you exhale very slow. You breathe in very slow, you exhale very slow. As you are visualizing and feeling your spinal fluid, Go up from your genitals through your solar center all the way up to your pineal gland and back down again. Going from your right side up and your left side down. The same applies for women except they have two centers. See, we have 12 melanin centers in our brain and 22 spiritual centers in our brain where the Europeans have two melanin sites in their brain. So that kind of exercise limits us. And the Chinese have fewer m melanin sites in their brain. So if we're doing a Chinese kind of spiritual exercise or meditation, it limits us because they don't have as many melanin centers as African people, the Chinese, the Japanese. We can't use their systems, and least of all, we cannot use the European system because it stops us from going to the 12 centers. The Chinese, the Japanese will probably stop at seven and say you have seven chakras or seven energy centers in your body. That's what they have. We have 12. The Europeans have two. So the highest melan melaninated people are African people, so we can't use these other culture spiritual exercises because they limit us spiritually. They're anti-melanin. That's why I'm saying you have to approach this thing and understand that within your structure is the temple of God. That's why they call the body a temple and explains all of these things to you. So we're going to go up in 12 times for our 12 sinners and do it that way. Not two times, not seven times, not nine times, but 12 times deep breathing and visualizing this energy going up and going back down. That's the spiritual exercise that we should be on while we're doing this fast. Even if the fast is for one day, we can uh, prepare for the fast using three days, do a one day water fast and come off the fast in three days. And while we're doing this, we're taking enemas and baths and doing our spiritual exercise, using the sun properly, walking barefooted, and uh, we're keeping clean thoughts in our mind. We're not against nature, we're not against ourselves, we're not against other people, and we are least of all not smoking, we're not drinking, we're not sneaking and eating meat, we're not doing any salt, any sugar, we're not using any lard or fats or any of these kind of uh, modern European foods to contaminate and pollute and poison our system. So we're abstaining from that altogether. We're not into arguing, fussing, arguing with ourselves, because it takes practice to argue, so usually people argue with themselves and they argue with another person. So we, we're going to do all of these things, create harmony within ourselves while we're on this fast. Remember that there's a very important about the herbs that I mentioned before, the fenugreek, the rose hip, uh, hibiscus, beverage the kind of herbs you can drink, hibiscus and rose hip, which tastes good and cooling to the body. Sometimes you may want to put a pinch of cayenne in one of your herbal drinks or a pinch of cayenne in your vegetable drink or fruit drink to kind of stimulate your system, but we want to keep the whole body participating in the fast because it's a holistic fast. It's for your body, your mind, as well as your spirit. That's why we have the uh, meditation, which Africans use, a trance. Uh, and we go into a trance state, which the Europeans call meditating, which keeps them in a kind of mediating part of their, their selves. We want to trance and go into a transition between ourselves and God, which we call a trance. And we want to do all of these things while we're on the fast. Understanding that the fast is not going to destroy our health, it's going to build our health. It's going to regenerate our system. It's going to help get rid of the pollutions and toxins that accumulate in your body and get stored in your muscles and in your bones and in your fat tissue. So periodically, we should use fasting. Uh, maybe once a month, once every uh, solstice, in between the seasons, the summer, winter, and fall. Uh, for religious purposes, 40 days and 40 nights. Uh, 
whatever the uh, schedule we're going to use, we should follow that. Fasting once a week is good also, where you eat for six days and one day you just take liquids. I mean, the fast can be geared to your needs, whether you're in a contaminated urban environment or in a country environment or not, you can gauge a fast for your needs. One day out of the week, you're gonna just drink fruit juice raw or vegetable juice raw and take digestive enzymes to help you break down the food and take an enema to help your body get rid of the waste. So fasting is a tool that we should um, put in our lifestyles and make it rather important for us. And this is very important for the children to see you do this, to, to exercise control, because by exercising control, control, it gives you more control and more ability to be holistic and Afrocentric because you cannot be African unless you eat African. And you cannot dress African and be African unless you eat African. All of this is part of our Afrocentric lifestyle, fasting. I hope you try it. The uh, world of natural medicine, the uh, herbal world, world of uh, natural cures for disease remedies of the body. What I'm going to try to do is give you a kind of overview of the herbs and some of their actions and how to use them and what specific purposes what herb, use, what herb is used for. Uh, in uh, herbal medicine, the science goes back to Egypt and goes before then even down to Sudan. Uh, we found herbs in the tombs and the pyramids such as fennel, we found licorice, uh, sandalwood was used to make King Solomon's temple. The herbs uh, have an ancient, ancient uh, history, but all that history is avoided in uh, today's uh, climate of herbal medicine. The whole field is controlled by the Europeans, and as you would have guessed, there are very few references made to Africa and African herbology, which founded the science of herbology amongst the Chinese, amongst the Japanese, amongst the Inca Indians, the Aztecs. This knowledge, this nutritional knowledge, and herbal knowledge comes from Africa. And it's being translated by other cultures such as the Chinese and Japanese and given to the Europeans. And then from there, we take it and try to bring it back to Africa so it can be most applicable to the African body, a body that is highly melanated and highly rhythmic. So whenever we're using herbal formulas, we have to always accentuate or uh, uh, use a combination of herbs to stimulate the pineal gland, which causes a gland reaction, the pineal gland to the pituitary to the hypothalamus, which is what we call it the triangle, the grand triangle. So we always try to stimulate those glands and then work the cure from there, working on a specific organ that we may be interested in, such as the kidney, the lungs, the reproductive organs, or the pancreas and spleen, or some muscle illnesses such as rheumatism, or some impurities in the joints, which we call arthritis. So first we stimulate the pineal gland, and then we go on with our specific cure when we're dealing with African people. But the information is very well distorted in this field, and is always accentuating the health and disease state of the Europeans. So the majority of the uh, remedies are for digestive problems and sexual problems. And as they come out of China and other countries, they gear their herbs toward the illnesses of their people based on their diet. So what we're trying to do is perfect a cure by getting rid of the illness which we got from the European diet and then restabilize our health by taking it back to Africa and restabilizing the health principles and health biochemical makeup of the African people based on our biochemical makeup, which is melanin-centered. So what we're going to do is kind of overview a few of the herbs first, and then we'll get into specific remedies and treatments. So let us look at these herbs first. Yeah, this is a nice herb to use. This one is petty spurge. This herb here, as you can see. And what we're going to use on that herb is the shoots. Now the shoot is this part right here. It's the part where the root grows from and the stem grows from, the shoot. Uh, almost similar to what you would call a root stock, uh, such as yams is a root stock. I'll show that to you as we progress along. But nonetheless, petty spurge is used for purgatives. And it's helped to uh, get out impurities in the system. We use the leaves as well as the, we call it the herbal part, the leaves and stems. 
And that's there's a, a purgative, a mythic, helps force impurities out the system. The other herb was used primarily for worms and fever. It's a herb named after an African man by the name of quassia. This is quassia, used for worms and fevers and rheumatism. And it's also good to get, a, get rid of addictions in the system, such as alcohol addiction and cravings for refined carbohydrates. This quassia, along with another supplement such as glutamic acid or glutamine and chromium, those three can be used to reduce cravings for alcohol, sugar, and those substances. Quassia, very good herb to use. Then we have the, uh, let me see, the poison lettuce over here. The poison lettuce. Poison lettuce, we use the leaves as well as the stems, which those combinations is called the herb, the leaf and the stem. That's, milk is used for, from that, we squeeze that out and we use that for lungs and we use that for the nervous system and it also increases the lactation. This is for the lungs and the yellow color kind of gives it away as to what part of the body it treats. The yellow is higher up in the color hierarchy and it's the higher part of the body so the lungs deal with fire and air so we use this high color yellow which is close to the sun. That's poison lettuce. Then we have what is commonly called evening primrose, and it's usually used in an oil form. This is primrose. It's used for PMS, premenstrual syndromes, evening primrose. It's also good for coughs, and it's astringent. It's good for the glands, uh, such as the liver and the spleen, and it's good for depression, as I mentioned before, with PMS. That's primrose. Then we get into private. Let me see, where's private? Right here, the one with the white flowers and the nice color berries, private. It's used for diarrhea, and since it's bitter, it works on the liver as well. It's also uh, astringent. The bitterness gives it the astringent quality, and it's good for a mouthwash, helps get rid of plaque. Then we have the uh, herb, eye bright. Eye bright and bilberry are used for the eyes. It strengthens the eyes. It's used for any sort of eye inflammation or eye disease because it, it causes a more perfusion of blood to come to the eye and nourish it. This is eye bright, red eye bright, along with bilberry. They're very good herbs for inflammation and also it can be used for colds. Then we have uh, I'll let you see another herb. It's quite beneficial. Let me go. I went the wrong way. Excuse me. Now we're getting into the berries. Let me see if I can make that clear for you. Uh, that's about as clear as I can get there. Can you see over here? Right here. This is known as black kirins. Black kirins are high in iron. They are high in iron, and as a refrigerant, it helps cool the body, and it's used for the kidney, and it's used for gout and rheumatism, because it helps flush out the impurities in the blood. That's black curin. Then we go to another berry right here, the rose hip. That's very popular, rose hip. Very hot, popular for treating. See? Rose hip berry right there. That's high in vitamin C. It's good for colds, it's good for pur purifying the system in the stomach and the nerves. Then we have the juniper berries. Juniper berries are used for the pancreas. Juniper berries, they have a mild taste, but they're usually used for the pancreas and for the urinary system of men, as well as women. It's good for gout and rheumatism, and it also helps curb the appetite, juniper berries, because it deals with the pancreas, which releases insulin, which burns the sugar and gives you energy, and then that way it helps deal with the appetite. Then we have the marigold. Marigold, this is sand on right here, and mostly this is used in Europe, it's used in the, for fruits as like a jelly here, the sandorn. You can buy sandorn jelly in Europe and various countries. But it's not very popular here in America. Uh, excuse me. Now we're going to go to some other medicinal herbs that uh, have a folklore history for curing parts of the body in specific. We have this marigold. 
This is a flower that they threw on Mahatma Gandhi when he died. Uh, this yellow marigold, it's good for the skin. It's good for the stomach, ulcers, boils, those kind of skin infections, marigold. A very good herb. Then we have, in the corner there, right over here, we have the male fern. This is a fern. Um, it's safer to use the uh, female fern, actually. The male fern, you have to really know what you're doing with it. This is used for tapeworms. And in the body, if it stays too long, it becomes poisonous. The female fern is much more safer. And the ferns, the largest one is usually the male, and the, usually the female, and the, and the largest one is usually the one that we don't really want to use. We want to use the female one. It's maybe more easier to identify and use. So the fern is a good herb, but I wouldn't really recommend you using it unless you get it from a health food store. Don't try to pick it in the wild, that is. Now we go to the, uh, the mint. The mints are all used. This is mountain mint. Mints are coolative for the body. They're used for digestion and used for the nervous system. This is mountain mint. Very good herb. Then we have mezzeron. This mezzeron is right here. Mezzeron. Mezzeron right here. This is a good herb. Very good and very good cur curative action. It's related to the petty spurge. I believe we showed that in a previous slide, which is usually called a wild pepper. And wild peppers are stimulants, and we usually use them for the skin and the respiratory system. And they also are irritants, especially the black peppers. But this is the petty spurge, spurge and mezzeron, in that uh, pepper family. Then we have mulberry right here. The mulberry is good for tapeworms. We usually use the juice from the leaf to get rid of fungus, which you call ringworms in the head. And we squeeze this juice to uh, get rid of the fungus infection called ringworms. We also squeeze the juice of the, the grape leaves to help purify the eyes. There's a leaf treatment system in the herbal uh, medicinal herbs. They use leaf tr treatment system. They use flowers, they use roots, they use the root stock, various parts of the plant. And there are various systems that we go into when we're combining. But we'll get into that when we go a little further. Then we have the moth herb, or marsh tea, or swamp tea. It's good for colds. Remember those higher colors, such as white, yellow, and orange, are usually high above in the, the system of the body, where you have the lungs. So this is used for colds, rheumatism, gout, and that sort of illnesses that attack the body, as the Europeans would say. And we have the mana tree, which has been used in Christian time to make mana bread. Mana. It's a combination of seeds. And this herb gets its name from that. But it's not necessarily the one that's used to make mana bread. Mana bread is any combination of seeds. But this was principal. They wanted the ingredients in former times. looking at the herb as it appears in the wild. We get these uh, metlocks, the, how the, the herb really appears in the wild, wild carrots as you would call them. Um, you, so when you're going out to pick them, you may get a disillusion and see all these plants around them because they weren't growing in that natural environment. But you can recognize them by their flowers uh, when you're going foraging for them and looking for them. Uh, could you stop for a minute, please? Here's another very interesting herb, the uh, butternut. The butternut herb is uh, used for many purposes. Some herbs we apply on the skin and make fomentations with. Some we drink and some we just smell. I have a, the butternut, or sometimes called black walnut. It's used for diarrhea, and it stops or drives up the milk and gets rid of colds and fevers and worms. This is butternut right here. Then we go to a very extringent type of herb called tomatil. This is tomatil right here. Very nice yellow flowers. Uh, the herbs are sometimes identified by the shape of their leaves, the shape of their stem, the shape of their flowers, whether they're monocotyledons, dicotyledons, how their seeds are shaped, and all those sort of names that they give them in European herbology, which is based on their system of worship and superstitions. We're just going to talk principally around the, the folklore and medicinal herbal properties, medicinal herbal properties of the plant. This is tormentil. Sometimes it's called bloodroot. 
and it's used for as an antiseptic and it's used to get rid of plaque around the teeth and inside the veins and arteries. It's good for hemorrhaging because of its astringent quality, tomatil. Then we're going to lung wart. And as you can tell from the name, what it does, it actually acts on the lungs themselves and opens up the respiratory system. It's called lung wart. It's a very good uh, herb, by the way. And this is comfrey. You find it a lot uh, mixed in with um, grass, and people call it uh, weed sometimes here in the wild, um, where, where we are in the islands. But uh, you will not find it too much in the city. This is comfrey. Comfrey has allotone in it. It's a very curative property. helps healing. It is used for sores of all sorts. It's also used for colds and respiratory kind of complaints. It's a very beneficial herb and it's often used in combination with respiratory type herbs. Comfrey, it heals wounds and as well as ulcers. Comfrey. And in the wild, in the wild environment, the undomesticated environment, the plants, the herbs are found all over. Some herbs grow around trees, some grow around the edge of the water. Some grow in the forest, some grows in the plains, some grow on the side of the hills. But this is only uh, the knowledge that you would need if you were a herb farmer, per se. But usually where they grow, they indicate the benefit that they have. The herbs that grow around the water are usually good for the lungs and respiratory system. And the ones on the side of the hill are good for the skin. And the ones around trees are good for circulation and nervous system. Um, that's going into the doctrine of signatures about herbs and plants. Let me clear this up for you. Now we're getting into some more herbs. Uh, I think we primarily identified thyme with uh, thyme, as some people call it, uh, as a flavor and as a culinary herb. But it's good for the nervous system. It's good for calming the nerves. It's good for colds and cramps and those sort of illnesses. But uh, principally, it's used in this country as a culinary type herb. But you can use it as a mouthwash. Now we have Veronica here. Veronica. There are many types of Veronica, but uh, most of them are used for the stomach and colds. Veronica. And then we get into the wild cherry. It's also a sedative and a calmative. This is wild cherry right here. And uh, red cherries, the ones that you eat, are good for black wild or black red cherries are good for arthritis and rheumatism. If you eat six uh, black cherries a day, it will help you with gout. But this is wild cherry. The wild cherry is astringent, it's sedative, and it helps soothe the nerves. Then we have wild plum, which is used a lot in Chinese medicine, oriental type medicine, wild plum. Wild plum is good for getting rid of worms, it's astringent, and it's also a laxative type herb. Then we have wound wart right here. Wound wart. See the two leaves here, dominating leaves. There's a very uh, interesting structure. And sometimes when you're dealing with the doctrine of signature, you go by the structure and the way the plant is formed. Looks like the tail fins of a fish of some sort. This plant here, wild wart. And sure enough, it's used for those things that deal with liquids, hemorrhaging. It's good for hemorrhaging. It's good for uh, worms, it helps get rid of them, it has a bitter quality and therefore it's a tonic for the liver and it's also good for convulsions which means it's good for the nerves. Then we have another herb here. This is yarrow which is good for uh, diabetes, it's good for the liver and it's good for the skin as well as yellow dock which is good for the liver, skin and pancreas. Very curative herb, has a multiplicity of purposes but principally, it's good for the skin and the liver. But uh, back to the uh, yarrow again, this plant right here, it's too good for, to, the Europeans believe it combated witches and stopped them from attacking them at night, witches. And it was used in the seven years uh, cycle of, of weddings that the Europeans had to stop the cycle of sevens, yarrow. It's used in a lot of their uh, superstitions. But nonetheless, yarrow is good for urine troubles, colds, uh, venereal diseases, and diabetes, and it's good for the pancreas. And we move on to another herb. This is valerium. 
This is the herb in which they take uh, the substance out that's used called Valium. So this is good as a calmative, it's good for the nervous system, it's good to soothe and nourish the nerves. Then we move on to another herb called Violet. Violet right here. And this has antiseptic qualities. Uh, it's sometimes bathed on animals, on fungus, the juice that is, of the violet flowers. It's bathed on fungus and infections. Violet. It's used for uh, padding. It's used, it was used to eat with, as a matter of fact, uh, for salads. And they used to wrap uh, it, wounds with it, which we call fomentations or padding of the wounds. And it's used even as a, in puddings and things of that sort. And because it has that antiseptic -like type quality, it's used for infections. Now we have some other herbs as they are in the wild, in their natural environment. We're going to move on to, um, let's, let's go into a centria. Centria is right here. You see this star quality it has right here? These stars are, are, uh, were related to the uh, spiritual hierarchy of plants. The ones that have a star in the center were believed to have a, a spiritual content to it. When you cut a lemon or orange in half, you will see a star sitting in the center. And that's because they uh, stimulate the higher part of your body, the center, the glands up in your head. And the uh, stars are formed, such as the yin and yang, when you put the two pyramids together. But nonetheless, they would go by the stars and the doctrine of signatures to find out the quality of the plant. And this, these leaves are from the centura plant. And it's used for worms, pains, gout, and rheumatism. Then we move on to another plant here. This is the yarrow flowers, as I showed you before. And it's good for the liver, it's for diabetes mellitus. And then we move down to the bottom here to the sundew. Now, sundew is a very good curative herb. It's used for antispasmodics. In other words, it's used to calm the nerves, sundew. And then we have calenda, calenda right here. It's mostly used for skin type of infections these days. It's harvested in the sun when the sun is in Leo, usually, and the moon is in Aries. That's when it's usually harvested during that particular time, but it's used for mostly skin diseases. It's used to combine with other herbs or cooked in olive oil. When you bake it in olive, put it in the oven and submerge it in olive oil and bake it from three to four hours. And then you can use it applied on the skin, add a few drops of tea tree oil to that. Then you have a nice skin oil, to, the soothing and antiseptic and gets rid of infections of sorts that appear on the skin. This is how the plants appear in the wild, and they can kind of mystify you again, as I said. As you see a whole cluster of them, you wonder what is what and which is which. But you can identify them by their colors or by their leaves. Um, as I mentioned before, break. Yeah, this is another herb, but this is how it appears in the wild. This is burdock. Burdock is used for arthritis. It's used as a blood purifier. It's for gout. It's used for the liver. It's used for asthma. And externally, you can apply it as you, know, you make a tea out of it, an infusion, or you simmer it, and you can apply it to the leaves of the burdock, making a tea out of it to acne and syphilis type of ailments. Yellow dock. This is how it appears. We've already seen it separated. There's yellow dock in the wild. A very beautiful plant. It's used for the liver, as I mentioned before, and it's used to purify the system. It's a very good curative herb. Now we get into some close-up isolated her herbs. This is a uh, horse, as it was once called, which the Europeans call whorehound. But we will talk about it as we go on with the other herbs. Uh, whorehound is good for colds and congestion of the chest, and it was once called horu. And the uh, Europeans call it Horus and whore hound, as it's called today. Chest congestion. Then you have Haru's tongue, which is called hound's tongue today by the Europeans. It's extringent, it's used for diarrhea, and it's also applied to burns and wounds of sorts. And you make a tea out of it. 
Then you have henbane, and of course we have the hen and the chicken, which is the name for this being the hen, and that's the chickens. Um, these uh, herbs have these kind of names that kind of can confuse you coming out of European mythology, but the curative properties are still in them. The henbane is uh, over here. It's principally substituted for opium. It has the same kind of effect that opium has without that kind of stupor that it, opium produces. It doesn't have the narcotic stupor, but it's in the same family. And it's used as a substitute for opium, which is used for pain and to soothe the nerves and things of that sort. If this plant is poisonous to chickens, by the way, and pigs. So the Europeans didn't particularly like it. But nonetheless, it is a substitute for opium. And hen and the chicken is used for liver, and it purifies the blood as well. This is colt's foot. Colt's foot. Colt's foot and hare's foot clover. We have the uh, what we call red clover and white clover. This is what you would call a clover but it's hare's foot, the rabbit's foot, clover. But we'll go back to the colt's foot, which is used for respiratory type of illnesses, open up your lungs and oxygenate your system. And it's also an extringent. Then we get to this trinity, which is called hare's foot, the trinity concept. The sun, the moon, and the earth is represented by the trinity. And clover is a blood purifier. It's used for colds, it's a diuretic, and it's applied to gout and rheumatism type conditions in the body. Then we go to the sage. Sage is used to help get rid of gray hair, is used to soothe the nerves, dry up the mammalian glands, that means get rid of the milk. It's used for, to reduce sweating. It's used for mucus congestion and it's used often to gargle with you know, when someone has tonsillitis. Then we go to St. John's wort. St. John's Warp, that's the herb, that means the flower and the stems and the leaves are used. And that's what we call a herb. It's good to curb bed wetting. It's good for insomnia, cramps, and the urine, uterine conditions, cramping of the uterus. And you can put this in the oil, bake it in the oven for three to four hours, and apply it to wounds and bruises. St. John's Warp. Uh, that's, that's it. Yeah, some herbs uh, properties are released better when you simmer them and some herbs properties are released better when you steep them. Usually how we uh, differentiate what to steep and what to simmer is by the leaves and flowers. We usually steep the leaves and flowers. That is, you boil the water and then you turn the heat off and put the herb in, the leaf or flower in, and leave it in the water from 20 to 30 minutes based on whether it's a leaf or flower uh, and the curative properties, how well they are locked into the leaf. So we usually steep the leaves and flowers, whereas when we get to a root, we simmer those. Uh, the best way to do that is to uh, boil the water first and then turn the heat down, the gas or electric down to the lowest point and put the herb in and let it simmer in that water for about 30 minutes. Now, to get the best mileage out of the root or herb, it's best to soak them, let them reconstitute themselves out overnight and then prepare them. But it's really not that necessary, but when you want to go and get the fullest benefits from them, it's best to soak them. But you can just do, as I mentioned before, boil the water and turn the heat off and put the herb, that's the leaf, the stem, and the flower in and let them steep for 30 minutes. or boil the water then turn the gas or uh, electric down to simmer and let the root or bark simmer for 20 to 30 minutes and then you turn off the uh, heat and let it stay in that water for 30 minutes and then strain. The important thing to do when you're straining is to strain the herb while it's still warm because it's going to still release, release the liquid from the plant but if you wait till the herb gets cool then the, the herb or the root or the bark or the flower is going to reabsorb the nutrients that you're trying to get out of the, the plant. So it's best to strain while they're still warm. Uh, usually you're trying to get a dual effect. You're trying to get a synergistic effect from the herbs. So sometimes it's best to combine them. In the African-American uh, folk medicine, we usually use up to about two to three herbs. 
when you get it into European medicine, they're using about five herbs in larger combinations. Uh, but uh, the African system, because of the melanin content, was able to extract more of the curative property out of the herbs. So they refined the process and they knew that the direct principles and properties of the herbs, so they used less herbs in their combination. They used one for the, the trinity, the body, mind, and spirit. That's why they use three herbs in combinations, or five at the most. But today we're trying to get away from the European disease state and get to a state of lesser disease and then move toward health. So we would probably start with more herbs, then reduce down to three, and then reduce down to one to get the curative property out of it. Uh, just for example, uh, this is a very popular uh, African type herb, this one here. This is known as uh, cayenne or capsicum, which is called red pepper. It's a bell pepper. It's not really like the red pepper you find in the store. This is about 10 times hotter, at least. And what it does is it stimulates, it's used as a stimulant. It helps liquefy the system or thin the blood. It's a driving kind of agent. And it's used, a, a little bit is used in combination with other herbs. You may not use a lot of it, but you'll use a little, a pinch, to help stimulate the action of the herbs you're using. So it's very good in a combination form or singularly. We use this cayenne along with a very popular herb that you've seen before, uh, cayenne and garlic. And both of these herbs are synergistic and when you combine them together, they're good for arthritis. They're also good for high blood pressure and they help thin the blood. When someone's suffering from clots and things of that sort, they may want to use cayenne and garlic especially for high blood pressure. Very good combination. For social reasons, some people may not want to use garlic and they have deodorized garlic because what you're after is the alcinin in the garlic and that's the principal ingredient in the garlic itself. So they're using combination. Then we have a herb such as alum root. You can see it's white. It's a right crystallized substance, as you can see. These are alum root crystals, and it's astringent. And some people brush their teeth with it for bleeding gums, which they call pyrrhea. If you want to stop bleeding, such as hemorrhaging of the uterus, or bleeding on the skin itself, you apply alum to it. It's a very strong astringent. It will tighten up the pores and shut down the arteries and stop it from bleeding. So you can apply this directly in to an open wound to stop the profuse bleeding. Uh, alum root along with such things as cayenne and garlic are very good in the raw area for someone who may get bitten by a pig or something of that sort because it stops the bleeding and the garlic is an antibiotic. The garlic herb itself is an antibiotic and it's used to get rid of infections. So you combine the alum root with the cayenne and put it on a pig bite to help a person with that sort of wound or injury. Well, sometimes it's good to see the herbs in their natural environment. So we're going to look at some of the herbs, how they appear. But the majority of people in the city, in the urban area, are going to come into contact with the herbs as they're presented here. That's why I'm showing them to you, so you know how they look when you go to buy them. But I'm going to show them to you in their natural uh, setting. Yes, this herb is burdock, as I showed you before. It is used for arthritis and rheumatism. It's a blood purifier. It's also used for skin diseases. It helps the skin to heal itself, so it's used for rashes and things of that sort. Burdock root. Then we go to uh, Wild American white willow bark. White willow bark is used for headaches. It has a precursor for acetylic salicylic acid, uh, and it's used for headaches and, and uh, pain without giving you that kind of a sleeping and sedative type of effect. So it's used for headaches and it's used for people with arthritic type pain or muscle type pain, white willow bark. Then we get into the wild African devil's claw root tuber. This is used for arthritis conditions. It was believed that wherever the devil walked, he left his footprint, his claw print, and be able to pull out the evil forces that the devil left. And as you may have guessed, the um, Europeans give it this negative title because it comes from Africa. While African Devil's Claw.
root, but it's a very uh, curative plant and it has that ability to also stimulate the pineal gland because of the high color content, pigment of it. Pigment goes to pigment, light goes to light in the system that supposedly John Heinemann introduced to the world, which comes out of Africa. So it stimulates the pineal gland as well as gets rid of those impurities. Then we go to the wild Appalachian black cohosh root, which has the uh, estrogen in it. This is good for arthritis, rheumatism, colds. It's good to balance the estrogen level in females, black cohosh. Now we go over here to marshmallow, which people call marshmallow. Uh, uh, because they like to call it marshmallow, but it's marshmallow root. And it is good as a soothing type of herb. It helps collect the impurities that may be released by another herb, such as garlic or golden seal. Uh, the, the impurities get released, but they have to be transported out the body. So marshmallow helps do that. So it's good for colds, transporting the mucus out of the lungs, and it's good for soothing the digestive tract. And then we move on to echinacea. Echinacea root is used to help cleanse the lymphatic system. And you can see from the color hierarchy that it also stimulates the pineal gland. It works in concert with that and the cerebral spinal fluid and helps milk glands. And it's good for virus infection. It's one of those main herbs that are used in immune formulas today for people that have AIDS. They usually use echinacea golden seal and porter I go along with cop chaparral and red clover for cancer and AIDS and severe illnesses echinacea antiviral type of plant good for the lymphatic system and for tea is used as a stimulant it's one of those Chinese type herbs but we have many similar herbs in America for tea and here is porter arco as I mentioned before which is a South American type of uh, bark that is used for infections, fungus infections, uh, such as yeast and the ringworm, as you call it, an athlete's foot, and it's a blood purifier. Then we have slippery elm bark, which is used for soothing the uterus, and it's used in a lot of douche formulas. It's also good for colds because it causes a type of mucus, and it helps carry other herbs, helps them bind together, so you mix them with formulas when you're trying to bind some herbs together and keep them in floating in the fluid to uh, affect a cure. So it's, it's in combination with other herbs, not for its curative properties, but because it helps form a little gel that carries the herbs and bond it better in the system, slippery elm. Now we have licorice, which has estrogen in it, which is good for digestion, it's good for colds, and it's good for cleaning the plaque away from the teeth, licorice root helps stimulate the appetite and helps metabolize carbohydrates as well. So white oak bark is a good astringent type herb and it's used for that property, it's used for colds, it's used for flu and help to get infections out of the skin, white oak bark. Then we go to butcher's broom root which is good for getting the milk, help lactation, that sort of thing. And we have ginger root which helps with edema, helps with digestion, helps with uh, premenstrual syndrome, and it relieves cramps if you drink it before the onset of menstruation. Ginger root. Yes, and now we move on to other herbs. We have done the eyebrow, we spoke about that before. before. It's used principally for the eyes, for inflammation. This is how it looks. Then we have buchu, African buchu leaves, which is good for urinary tract infection. It's a diuretic, and it's good and soothing for kidney type of ailments as well. Then we have chamomile, which is a calmative. It's used, it's used usually in combination with other calmatives such as skull cap or hops or catnip. But it's a calmative and it's good for the skin. Skull cap is another calmative, good for tension and stress and headaches. And it's usually combined with another herb such as hops or catnip or chamomile. A skull cap, as you can recognize for the name, is good for headaches and stress in the skull. This is catnip, another calmative herb. Then we have fever few, which drops fevers. And is also good for migraine headaches, principally. That's what it's used for. 
migraine headaches, stress, and fevers. When you take it, you have few fevers. It drops the fever for you. Then we have yucca, which is used for arthritis and rheumatism, as it gets rid of crystallized waste in the joints and muscles. Then we have this common weed that it grows all over the cities and in the country on the roadside, red clover. Cows that ate a lot of it, their milk was a little pink, and they always said they were living in clover, which represented a form of richness and nutrition. The clover is a blood purifier. It's good for the skin. And it's also good for colds, red clover purifier. Then we have chaparral, which is, for some reason has been made illegal by the Europeans again. They classify some plants as legal, some plants, plants as illegal. So this year, in 1973, they made chaparral illegal. Chaparral is one of those combination herbs that are used in immune formulas. Chaparral is good for purifying the blood, it's good for arthritis and rheumatism and skin infections and all sorts of diseases. It's a good, good herb to use, but of course it is illegal now. Then we have blessed thistle, which is used for the hormone level in women. It's used for colds, and the thistle refers to the clitoris. Nonetheless, the, the, the clitoris was called blessed, and that's where this term comes from, the blessed thistle. And it's used for female sorts of ailments. Then we move on to alfalfa, which it has uh, a lot of vitamins and minerals. It is just used for its vitamin and minerals contents and to nourish the system. It has vitamin A, vitamin K, the iron, and it is highly nutritious. It's used in the vitamin and mineral combinations. And it can be combined with most other herbs to give you the nutrients you need in your formula. And you have gota cola, which is used for the brain. It's increased the memory and it's good to give tissue perfusion for the prostate as well and it's good as an energizer along with ephedra you use golden go to cola damian and sarsaparilla that generates the nature of male systems coupled with ginseng go to cola for the memory and uva ursi which is used for urinary tract type of infection infections the diuretic and as you can see it resembles the opening of the uterus in the female, and that's hence the name Uva Ursi. Now we have juniper berries, which is good for the pancreas. It's also good for the urinary tract, juniper berries. It's commonly used for male kind of complaints with the prostate and things of that sort, but it is good for the urinary system. Then we have ginkgo, which uh, gives a lot of nourishment to the brain and helps the memory and is good for spiritual things. But it's also good for colds, severe colds, asthma, respiratory kind of complaints. It's used to combine with another herb, ginkgo and mullein and lobelia. Those sort of things are used for respiratory complaints. But this is one of the stronger ones for uh, congestion of the lungs and asthma, ginkgo. Red raspberry is primarily used by females to strengthen the uterus. Also, it's also used for diabetes mellitus. And it's also used to help with uh, the uh, lactation. And it's a good herb, and it's used primarily with uh, women that are pregnant because it strengthens the uterus, and it also strengthens the arteries. So it can be used with any sort of weakness of the tissue. Red raspberry. Then we have fenugreek. And your Greek is a um, mucus kind of herb, which is good for digestion, helps wash out impurities in the system, and it has choline in it, which breaks down fat. And we have black walnut hulls, which are used for fungus infections and bacterial infections and skin diseases. And it's also good to get rid of worms with black walnut. And fennel is good for weight loss because it helps with digestion. It's also good for edema, swellings. It's good for sores to make a fomentation of it and put it directly on sores. It's good for a wash for wounds, fennel. And garlic, which has uh, antibiotic characteristics. It's used for infections, it's used for colds. It has a high vitamin C content. It's used to help drop high blood pressure and in combination with cayenne, garlic and cayenne for high blood pressure. Cayenne is a blood thinner. 
It helps with digestion, it's a stimulant, and it's used in combination with many formulas to help boost them. And we have hawthorn berries, which is good for the heart. It helps strengthen the heart and bring a lot of nourishment to the heart. So it's used for heart ailments, uh, uh, racing heart, fibrillations, and uh, heart malfunctions, hawthorn berries. It's also used for the prostate too. Psyllium seeds is mostly a bulking agent and some people take that before they eat a meal to give them a full feeling. It helps wash out the colon, small intestines because it's a bulking agent and it gets kind of slimy in the system. But you have to drink plenty of water when you take psyllium seeds for that purpose. Cassandra is mostly a stimulant type of herb and it's used for the blood as well. Even in primrose is used for the nerves and primarily for PMS these days. Gua gum helps to slow down the burning of sugar and can be sprinkled on food to help reduce the effect of hypoglycemia and a weak pancreas, gua gum. These are how the herbs look, but the most of the time when you see them in the herb stores, they're in the jars and in the form in which I'm gonna show you. So they'll be more familiar to you that way. And see, the herbs are prepared thusly. You usually use a standard type of measurement of one teaspoon to a cup of water. One teaspoon of herb to a cup of water. And in the case of flowers, you may use a palm, which can fit in your palm to a cup of water. And you always add an extra glass for the pot, for the, the amount of herbs that are, can evaporate or the amount of fluid that's reabsorbed by the dried herb itself. So you add a glass of water to the pot or two glasses of water to the pot according to the size one glass, two glass, or three glasses of water to the pot because that amount of herb is reabsorbed or lost in evaporation. I mean water, that is. So the standard measurement is one teaspoon to a cup of water of herbs and roots and so forth. And we try to use them in combination. We want to uh, get rid of the impurities, destroy the impurities, and flush them out of the system. So we use one herb to carry it out and one herb to destroy and one herb to flush it out of the system, out of the pores. So sometimes we open up the pores. Say for instance, let me give you an example. We have someone with a respiratory problem, uh, which is caused a lot in the cities. So we have a respiratory problem. We know that according to traditional folklore, this herb here, which is called mullen, is good for respiratory complaints helps nourish and strengthen the lungs and the sinuses. So we take mullen, but we have to deal with transportation. So we want to get the mullen in the system. So we open up the pores. So we have mullen as our principal ingredient. So we're going to use three parts mullen, because that is our principal curative ingredient. And now we want to get it in the system. So what are we going to do? We're going to use hyssop. Hyssop will get it into the system for us. It opens up the pores, you see, hyssop. So we use the three parts of our curative herb, and we're using one pot, part of hyssop to get it into the system. Now we want to flush it out. Now we can get something that's very mucus forming to flush it out, or we can get something that's going to liquefy it to flush it out. Now, oh, let's say we want to liquefy it some. We want to use something will help digest it or break it down, and that would be fennel. And so we pick fennel. So we're using three-part mullen, two-part fennel, and one-part hyssop. In that formula, we're just going to use the three, two, and one combination, because now we're going into the process of combining the herbs using three. And that we can use for the lungs. Now suppose someone has a severe lung problem. Now, we know that we're dealing with African people, so now we're gonna go to ginkgo. And ginkgo acts on the brain, on the memory, and as well it's gonna help stimulate the pineal gland. So now we're gonna use ginkgo, which is good for severe colds and asthma and respiratory type of complaints. So ginkgo is now going to be our primary healing herb. 
ginkgo. So we're going to take ginkgo, we're going to combine it with another herb that's good for the respiratory system, and it's also good for purifying the blood. That means it gets rid of impurities, remember? We're going to help break down the waste, so now we're going to use ginkgo and red clover. So we're using three-part ginkgo, two-part red clover. The ginkgo is getting it out of the pores, the red clover is also getting it out of the pores and destroying it because it purifies the blood. So we have three-part ginkgo, two-part red clover, and we follow up with another respiratory type of herb. In this case, it's going to be lobelia. Lobelia. We're going to use one part lobelia. Lobelia has a tendency to make people feel a little noisy. Noisier may cause vomiting, so we don't use very much of this. It's used in severe cases of asthma. The tincture is used for children to drop it under their tongue in severe cases of asthma and respiratory kind of conditions. So lobelia is very beneficial in a tincture and extract form. But we're going to use it just for a severe cold or respiratory type of complaint, congestion in the chest. So we're using the ginkgo and we're going to use the red clover and lobelia. Three parts ginkgo, two parts red clover, one part lobelia. And that will help with severe respiratory kind of conditions, break down impurities, flush it out the system. Now let's try to uh, purify the blood and build up some immunity and health. Now we know we have to stimulate the pineal gland in some way. We know ginkgo does it. These two herbs themselves increase the flow of blood to the brain and is good for the memory. So we know these two do that, ginkgo and gotocola. So we're going to include them in our formula just for that purpose. Ginkgo and go to Kohler. We can use both, but we don't have to. We'll just use one of them. Now we're going to purify the person's blood and build up their immune system. So you saw a picture of that herb called Pordiaco. This is how it looks in the herb stores. And we grind it up in the herb stores and put it in tablet forms and make pills out of it. Pordiaco, a blood purify good for the immunities, gets rid of fungus and viral infections and bacterial infections. Pour the aco. We're trying to defend the person's health at this point, so we're going to use pour the aco. And we're going to combine that herb with another one that's kind of popular, which is called golden seal. We have that in a powdered form here. It's a yellow powder, it's a yellow gold kind of color. I don't know if you can see that too well and it's called golden seal. It's good for purifying the blood for infections of all sorts, bacteria and viral. It's good for stimulating insulin production as well. And it's good for brushing your teeth with myrrh and alum. It helps with pyrrhea. So we're gonna use golden seal, portiaco, those two herbs, and we're now gonna go to ginkgo to help with the pineal gland, as we mentioned before. Now, to stimulate the gland, to get it to move, to function more, we're going to have to use something that deals with the glandular system itself. In specificity, that would be a herb like Damiana. A Damiana is also used for a sexual stimulant but its primary purpose is to help stimulate the glands and get them to behave. But this is how you will see the herb in the store in this kind of form. Damiana. So now we have a formula there. We have portiaco, we have golden seal, and they are roots, so they have to be simmered 30 minutes. And after they are simmered, you turn off the gas, then you add the herb, such as Damiana or ginkgo or go to cola for the pineal gland, and you let those steep for 30 minutes. And after they steep, you're combining all these herbs together in the same pot. So we know principally we're trying to protect the immune system, so we're going to use equal parts of portiaco and golden seal. We'll use three parts portiaco, three parts golden seal, one part damiana, one part ginkgo or gotacola 
help with this process of purifying the blood. We could add another herb to it, up to five, but all we're trying to do is focus on the purification of the blood. Say for instance, we have a, another respiratory type of complaint. We get into another herb just strictly for the respiratory system, and that's pleurisy. This is how it looks in the herb store. Pleurisy, along with elecampane, are principally used for respiratory type of illnesses. These two herbs are combined together, they're synergistic. So we're going to use elecampane and pleurisy, and we're going to simmer them for 30 minutes, one teaspoon of herb to one cup of water, remember? And we're going to try to drive that action. We may add a pinch of cayenne, principally just to drive it, act as a driver. Just a pinch of cayenne. We don't need much. Just a pinch, just to drive it along. And we're again working on the respiratory system. We're again doing that. And we want to get to the glands. Again, we're going to use either the ginkgo or the gota cola to get the tissue perfusion to the brain. And we're going to use a stimulator for the glands. As I mentioned before, Damiana, blessed thistle, they stimulate the glands. Uh, now we get to the female system. This is a very popular herb. This is dung qua. Dung qua helps to balance the hormone level and it's used for PMS. It's used for PMS primarily, but it's also used for menopause. It's good for all kinds of glandular disturbances as well as another herb called black cohosh, which you saw in one of the pictures earlier, black cohosh. They both balance the female system, except black cohosh has a multiplicity of functions. This is primarily used for the estrogen level, PMS, and menopause, and for teenagers going into puberty, which would be a rites of passage type of herb. Dung Kwa or black cohosh in combination with blue cohosh. When you have teenage girls going into puberty, you, use, you have to balance their hormone level, and that's why you go to these herbs such as Dung Kwa, black and blue cohosh, blessed thistle and damiana. In the case of boys, you want to stimulate their hormone level, so you would use something like sarsaparilla for a boy going into puberty. Sarsaparilla, along with a blessed thistle, will help with the hormone level of the male. Sometimes they use a stronger combination of sarsaparilla and damiana, but we have to use gota cola as well in this formula to help the boy going into puberty, to help his hormone level become balanced. The thing about sarsaparilla, I might add, is usually used in cons combination with sassafras. The sassafras is a blood purifier, and the combination of sarsaparilla and sassafras is used for arthritis, typically. You use sarsaparilla, sassafras, and burdock in combination, equal parts of each, and that treats arthritis. We've done the hormone level, we've done something for colds, and we've done something for the glands of the brain, the pineal gland, and the brain itself to help with the memory with the ginkgo and the gota cola, but we didn't do anything for the heart. Now we're going to increase the blood perfusion to the heart with what they call hawthorn berries. It strengthens the muscles of the heart. Hawthorn berries. This will be our primary treatment ingredient and to increase the blood supply to the brain. We will use some ginkgo or gota cola as well with the hawthorn berries for the uh, system. So we would use this, hawthorn berries, along with juniper berries, if we were going to treat some kind of prostate problem. We combine them in equal parts, along with a ginkgo or a gota cola for the glands of the brain, as in heaven is on earth. So we have to treat both of the glandular systems to keep them in balance, mind you. Now, because we live in a city environment, our liver has become very toxic and we may get gallstones and kidney stones and accumulations of cholesterol. Then we get to something that can take care of that. This is a herb, mostly seeds. Is a, I don't know if you can see that quite clear or not. This is the form you will see it in in herb store. This is milk thistle, which is very good 
the liver disorders. It helps cleanse the liver, get rid of gallstones, and rejuvenates the liver, especially with livers damaged by drugs, alcohol, and aspartame, which you call NutraSweet. <coughs> Very good herb for that. And to stabilize the energy level, we use something like ginseng. Ginseng root. Um, let me see if you can see that at all. That's the root in its form right there. That's how the root looks, but most of the time you see it in powder. That's ginseng or ginseng root. It stabilizes the energy in the system. It increases your endurance. And it also helps with the prostate problems. It's good for females as well in combination with ginseng and dunkwa. It helps strengthen the glandular system in the female. To get rid of excess fluid and those premenstrual syndromes, we pointed to the ginseng, ginger that was growing, but this is the form you will see it in in the herb store. This is ginger for bloating around menstruation time and for edema of the legs, swelling of the feet and the, and the legs. Uh, you can soak in ginger, make a ginger tea and soak your feet in it. It gets rid of edema and helps with headaches. A very beneficial herb for cleansing and healing are the herbs called comfrey. This comfrey has this allotone in it. This is the form you'll see it in the stores like this. This is comfrey. It's cut up and clean. You see? It's good for healing. It's good for colds and mucus congestion. But the most popular thing, and since 70%, over 70% of the Europeans take things for digestion, mostly laxatives, it's a large cell along with aspirin. As I showed you before, white willow is a natural form of aspirin. This is what aspirin is made from, acetylsalic acetylgastic, allicin is in it. This is white willow, this is the form you will see it in, in herb stores. White willow is good for headaches, nerve problems. That's one of the biggest sellers in European countries. The aspirin and the laxative. Let me show you one of these strong laxatives. This is one of the strong ones. Let me see if you can see that. And this is the leaves, and it's known as senna. Senna is a laxative. You may need about three of these to move you. Some people make the tea stronger, but laxatives work by irritating the colon. And the body tries to get rid of the irritant, and in the process of getting rid of the irritant, it gets rid of the constipation condition. Senna, that's a strong laxative. Then we have the mild laxatives such as Cascara Sagrada. This is Cascara Sagrada. It's a mild laxative, but it still works by irritating the system. And sometimes you have to soothe the laxative by combining it with ginger so it won't gripe your stomach. So we use ginger or we use fennel to soothe the laxative effect. And I showed you fennel earlier. Then we have the hops. This is the one that uh, the Europeans make the beer out of. This plant here called hops. It's good for the nervous system. It's very soothing. Hops. We did do the uh, liver with the milk thistle, but there are other herbs for the liver as well, such as the yarrow and the dandelion. Uh, let me show you some dandelion here. Mm -hmm. Here is dandelion leaves, and then we have dandelion root. See, this is the form it comes in, dandelion. And then this is dandelion root here. I wonder if you can see any of that. It's a very good herb. They both work on the liver and they go for the skin. And dandelion, along with chickweed, is good for curbing the appetite. So we use dandelion and chickweed in combination with a nutritive herb, as I pointed out before. One that's loaded with vitamins and minerals, that is alfalfa. It's good in combination with weight loss formulas. You use chickweed, dandelion, and alfalfa in equal parts. And remember, use one teaspoon to a cup of water. Quite beneficial. Alfalfa. So we covered something for headaches. Uh, did I show you what the fever few looks like? We saw it in its natural state. This is the herb that's used for headaches and pain, principally for migraine headaches, as fever few is. So we would combine, say, fever few 
with white willow and that's the herbs we would use for the pain that goes along with the condition known as arthritis and rheumatism without giving the sedative effect because you can soothe the nerves with hops and skull cap but it helps you relax and it may put you to sleep as well and we may not want to do that then we have things that are especially good for the hair such as this herb here uh, this one is called nettle this is good for the hair this is nettle nettle and rosemary are traditionally used for the hair so we did the liver we did the juniper berries which you know is good for the pancreas and we did the heart and we did things that are good for the brain this is juniper berry which is good for the pancreas and the urinary tract these are berries juniper berries so we did something for constipation the urinary tract and specifically the uva ursi as you saw in the picture this is how it looks in the herb stores this is used for burning of urine and urinary tract infections and things of that sort also helps with the kidney and helps with edema all diuretics help flush out toxic liquids in the body so we use these herbs in combination and this is how they're presented to you in the store and we have one more here that's very good for flushing out waste as I mentioned before this is Irish moss, which gets very mucus in the body and helps carry out toxins and waste. And it's also soothing to the digestive system. And the famous eucalyptus tree, which makes this respiratory type herb, eucalyptus, is used for colds. It's quite popular in commercial remedies. This is the actual eucalyptus itself and as good as an aromatic to inhale to open up the nasal passage sometimes the Europeans in their formulas they use another herb for asthma and respiratory complaints known as ephedra it's also good for weight loss because it speeds up the system and in that process it speeds up the burning of energy and therefore it liquefies things and it's used for asthma and respiratory type complaints and helps to speed up the system so along with Ephedra and Damiana and Gota Kohler, those things are used for the reproductive system in, in principle. And the herbs come in liquid forms, they come in capsules, and some people prefer to get them in the loose form so they can see what they're getting and see how to make it. And they feel as though they put some more in contact with nature to actually touch it and be a part of the curative process. And it's also cheaper to buy the herbs in bulk form. And you can make up to a gallon of herbs and store it in the refrigerator in a brown jar. And if you don't have a brown jar, you can use a brown paper bag and make a week's supply of herb and take a glass or two every day to help with, cure whatever illness you're working on, be it the pancreas, the liver, your digestive system, your hormone level, your lungs, your hair, your skin with the burdock and the chickweed, which works on the skin, and your digestive system or high blood pressure you use the cayenne and garlic as I mentioned and also nettle and hyssops help to drop the blood pressure and normalize it for you so the world of uh, being in control of yourself and understanding the herbs is made quite easy for us today because the herbs are manufactured by big herb farmers that are Europeans and they tend to not focus on the combinations that African people need. Those combinations help stimulate the pineal gland and stimulate the melanin production to give a little more blood to the brain, such as go to cola and, of course, ginkgo and things that stimulate glands, echinacea, which helps clean the glands, and damiana and blessed thistle and sarsaparilla, those type of herbs that work specifically on the glands. And then we have specific herbs for the females, such as Dunqua that works on their glandular system, which should be used during the rites of passage of teenage girls, as well as the Sarsaparilla, Damiana, and Gota Cola for rites of passages for the boys. These herbs help to normalize the body, and they get rid of anything that stops the body from being in homo homeostasis and balance. That's what they principally do. They go to the organ, 
that is in need of them. They don't go where they're not needed. They only go where they're needed. Synthetic drugs go all over the body. They go to healthy cells, they go to sick cells. And when they go to healthy cells, they call that the side effect of the drug. But only when you go to nature do you get specific reactions. The Hawthorne berry is going to specifically work on the heart. The juniper berry is going to work on the pancreas. It's going to work on your blood sugar level because these plants are alive and they work well with live people whereas the allopathic system which you call the medical doctor works on synthetic medicines that are dead and they kind of dead in your system and takes away the electromagnetic aura from your the 12 melanin centers in your brain and in your colon and, and in your chakra which is a highly concentrated areas of melanin which they call chakras and chi forces and these add to the energy of your body help to stimulate it whereas allopathic medicine drains energy from your body and goes to another secondary illness which you have to treat either now or later in the cyclical formation of the illnesses. Some illnesses show up every two years, the waste builds up and then it comes out and you think it's a new illness when it's the same illness trying to purge itself out of your system. So these herbs work in harmony with the body and the cyclical nature and help cleanse the body. I hope this is introduction to herbal medicine has helped you on your way to achieving some degree of health knowing that we are not coming from a state of disease we're coming from a state of health and we came into the disease when we came in contact with the European and we're trying to free ourselves from those disease and come back to our health if we follow the European system of medicine we're going from one disease to another disease degenerating our system decreasing the uh, proficiency of our glandular system the, the actually weakening the immunity in the body altogether and also destroying the activity of the pineal gland by taking these synthetic things. We need to go closer to nature to preserve our bodies closer to nature. Because once you destroy the body, you have no other place to live. You can't move and leave a bad body. You have to stay in the body you have created with ill health. So where else can you go but in your body? So if you want to stay in this living temple of God, you must go to God's curative herbs. God made a herb for every illness known to man. This is what our ancestors believed and followed. And this is what brought our civilization up to its height. And this is what kept us as the most powerful people on this planet. Nature and being close to nature and the rhythmicity of the plants and the rhythmicity of our pineal gland. I thank you.